uh, thank you for your presence here uh, for another online CNC meeting. Today, we welcome Professor Philippe Duarte Santos from uh, C3C and from the Faculty of Sciences of the University of Lisbon uh, for the um, CNC meeting entitled IPCC Emission Scenarios confronted with historical data and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on climate, climate change. Um, so thank you, Professor Philippe Duartsen for accepting our invitation. And I also thank Professor Rui Pita Perdigão, uh, who will present also from C3C, who will present Professor Philippe Duartsen. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Professor Rui Perdigão. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for attending this very special um, meeting where uh, Professor Philippe Duartsens is going to uh, present uh, the, the amazing work that he has been developing uh, with, um, with his students, with his teams, and um, a, a little forward. Um, Professor Philippe is an eminent physicist, very interdisciplinary. So it's uh, the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity in person, ranging from fundamental theoretical physics uh, all the way into climate system sciences and sustainability at the forefront of both natural and social system sciences. Um, so he, he held a chair in physics at the, at the Faculty of Sciences from the University of Lisbon, uh, retired, jubilated uh, with all honors, and uh, he was key in the courses in the fields of environmental sciences and climate, uh, and, and climate change. He was also the founder of the group CCM, Climate Change Impacts Adaptation and Modeling, that I currently represent. So he was the founder and started from a small core and the group grew steadily until becoming the community that is now and it is also part of uh, CU3C. Uh, Professor Flip is president of the National Council for Environment and Sustainable Development. Um, and he was nominated by a resolution of the Council of Ministers uh, on the 9th of March of 2017 and still renewed. Also coordinator of the scientific panel of the National Strategy of Adaptation to Climate Change. Uh, has been a visiting professor in various universities in the United States and in Europe. Um, he is also the chair director of the doctoral program in climate change and sustainable development policies, which involves uh, the University of Lisbon, the, the new University of Lisbon and University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. So he was also vice president of the Commission for the United Nations for the Pacific use, peaceful use of the outer space. And uh, so he was also manager of the deve sustainable development, uh, global change and ecosystem area four of the SciTech Ibero-American program of science and technology for development from 2007 to 2011. So his honors also go all the way to having been review editor of the fifth report of IPCC um, from the United Nations. Uh, and he's also effective member of the, the Lisbon Academy of Sciences. So he's member of the, also the independent uh, observatory for analysis, accompaniment and evaluation of the forest and rural fires uh, in Portugal. So the many, many honors um, make it a huge, huge honor for having his presence here today to share his groundbreaking work. And uh, I'm very, very much looking forward to, to having uh, such an inspiring uh, person, a beacon of light. And actually, I must say on a personal basis, he is the reason why I joined CA3C myself. I do not live in Portugal, but I moved uh, partially to Portugal because I am with him and I have utmost uh, admiration and I want to, to, to really, really feel that his legacy will continue for ages to come. Thank you very much. Professor Flip, the floor is yours. Good, good morning. Good morning to, uh, to all that, that are listening and thank you for, their, for, for your presence. Uh, I wish to uh, start by, by thanking the invitation to, to make this uh, this presentation and uh, also to thank very much the, the kind words of uh, Professor Rui Perdigão uh, about, my, about myself. Um, so um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, um, the scenarios of the IPCC uh, and um, 
especially I'm going to talk about uh, comparing them with um, uh, with the historical um, with the historical uh, data. So um, uh, I'm trying here to to have the um, to have the the the, the my my presentation. <clears throat> so let's see how this works out. So this I think it's this one. I can switch off. And this one also. Now. If you need any help or if you need us to, to share the screen, please let us know. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I usually do this, but uh, today I, I don't know what's... Uh, it was difficult to open ah. <laughs> the system, you know. I mean, so yes, you can... You can um, yes, you can, you can... I guess you can... Share the screen from my side. Yes, yes, you can. Okay. You can do that, and I'll. I'll... Oops. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, yes. Well, thank you very much. So, um, well, ne next slide. Yeah. Well, this is uh, quite well known. I'll, I'll start by my uh, making a very short uh, introduction to to climate change. Um, this is um, evidence for the increase in the concentration of um, carbon dioxide. Um, so a 46% increase um, since the um, since 1750s, since that uh, since the Industrial Revolution. The next slide you see. The next slide you see uh, the same. Uh, I mean, the, the data on the increase in CO2 concentration, but now in a, in a scale of 10, um, uh, of uh, um, 10,000 years, which is uh, quite a long time since uh, um, 8,000 years before, before um, AD. Um, so uh, you can see that um, uh, it was a bit lower when um, in, in, in the beginning. I mean, uh, in the, this is all during the Holocene, but it was rather stable. And then there is this very strong increase um, since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in the next slide, you see um, that to, to find in the... Um, um, paleoclimatic data, a concentration of CO2 comparable with um, the concentration that we have nowadays, which is uh, a bit higher than 400 um, parts per million in volume, uh, we have to go back uh, about two to three million years. So, um, uh, of course, if we go um, to earlier times to something like um, 50 million years ago, then the concentration of CO2 in the Eocene was um, much higher. I mean, it was uh, of the order. I mean, these are estimates. They have um, uh, quite uh, large error bars, but um, they are very likely to have been of the order of a thousand ppmv. And um, and then they have been decreasing. Uh, of course, I don't have time to, 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 to talk about that, but um, to find the same concentration, we, we have to go back until two to three million years ago. So um, in other words, the, the, the value that we have at present is, is not uh, a new thing for the Earth system. Um, no way. It's, it's not a new thing, but uh, the change, the, uh, the pace of change of the CO2 concentration is probably uh, quite um, rare in the history of uh, the Earth system. 
Uh, there are also some research on that, but uh, I, I will go forward. So in the next slide, you can see that um, another greenhouse uh, gas, which is methane. And uh, the figure on the right is uh, interesting. Uh, it goes from um, uh, 19, um, uh, 1985 uh, to, to the present, to 2020. And you see that it was stabilizing, stabilizing around uh, the beginning of this century. And, um, and then it started to increase. Uh, a curious thing is that the Paris Agreement was, um, was drawn, uh, was um, uh, conceived uh, on the basis uh, that this, um, um, this stabilization of methane would, uh, would continue. But uh, in fact, it's increasing. And um, we don't know for sure what are the reasons, but it's probably due to fracking, to, uh, to the exploration of oil through fracking, through the technology of fracking and also natural, natural gas, especially in the United States. The next slide. Uh, and this is um, then the, the data regarding the uh, global mean uh, temperature uh, at the surface of the earth since 1880. And um, you have there the uncertainty in gray, and you have then a moving average uh, in, um, in, in, in red, and the annual mean are the dots. You see there is some variability, but there is a, a clear increase uh, since the 70s until, until the present. The next slide, please, Martha. Um, so th this is to, to say, that uh, uh, in some regions, uh, the increase in temperature, which uh, at the global scale uh, has been of one degree uh, Celsius uh, since um, the industrial uh, period, uh, uh, the industrial revolution, um, this increase of one degree Celsius is uh, of course not uniform on the Earth's surface, it's much, it's, it's larger in, 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 on land than on the ocean. And uh, in some regions um, on land, which involve land and ocean, this is the case of Mediterranean, this increase has been larger. So in the Mediterranean, um, the increase has been uh, about 1.4 uh, degrees Celsius. It's the, the curve in blue that you find in this, uh, in this slide. Next slide, please. Now, uh, here you see one of the consequences of um, uh, also for the Mediterranean because uh, it's uh, of course of special interest to um, um, to the country where I live uh, and um, in particular to many resources like water and agriculture. Uh, there has been a decrease in um, in precipitation uh, uh, along the all the coasts of the Mediterranean, which are indicated in, in red. And uh, this tendency uh, has uh, become more, um, uh, si more significant, more uh, uh, in the beginning of the, the 70s. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and this is for Portugal. And um, you see, this is data from the, uh, the National Weather uh, Institute. Um, and shows per decade uh, the precipitation. Um, and uh, you see a very strong variability and a decrease, uh, a significant decrease again from the 70s, end of the 60s, um, which uh, is not only in Portugal, but also in Spain and in many other uh, regions of the Southern Europe. Next slide, please. So, um, uh there is uh, uh, there was the paris agreement um in uh, 2015 uh, and uh, the, one of the objectives of, of this paris agreement is to um, maintain the increase uh, of temperature below two degrees celsius and this corresponds to these two trajectories to these two yellow trajectories um uh, uh, in this um, slide that has 
the emissions, the CO2 emissions. And this, uh, um, this uh, trajectory here uh, in brick color uh, is uh, without any measures of mitigation. Uh, that's to say of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we have two trajectory, trajectories here because um, um, this involves some probability. So the, the, the darker yellow trajectory uh, has a lower probability of um, keeping the, the earth system, the, the atmosphere below two degrees increase and um, light yellow, a uh, larger probability since the decrease in the emissions is larger. So the next slide, um, shows that uh, the national determined contributions that the countries have made in the context of the um, Paris Agreement. It's important to mention that uh, all countries uh, in the world have um, uh, have accepted uh, in in, in uh, at the time of the Paris Agreement. Uh, uh, to make a contribution, the national determined contributions. And, uh, and also we know that uh, yesterday, precisely, uh, the United States has uh, withdrawn from the, uh, formally withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. But um, uh, all the, these pledges for mitigation are not enough to follow the trajectory leading to two degrees. Um, uh, to the two degrees Celsius objective. And they lead us uh, to uh, a temperature of 3.6 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. So on the next slide, please. Um, and, and here is it's just to show, uh, um, giving the example that I mentioned before of uh, annual precipitation, uh, the change, the projected change by uh, climate uh, annual average precipitation in Europe uh, with an increase of 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius, and 3 degrees Celsius. And you see that uh, uh, the decrease in annual um, precipitation, that's the, that's the brown color, uh, is um, stronger as, uh, as this uh, temperature increases. Uh, so um, this will be one of the consequences. Of course, there are many other consequences, but I, I just mentioned this one as an example. Next slide, please. Um, here, well, here we, we, we go into the scenarios and uh, this is still not quite a scenario, but uh, in this figure you see uh, in gray, you see in gray the historical emissions and see the historical emissions that have been uh, growing historical emissions of C, uh, of, um, of carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide is, is the, the greenhouse gas that is more important. And uh, it contributes to with more than 60%, about 65% of the radiative forcing of the greenhouse gases that have anthropogenic emissions. So uh, in gray, you see this increase. And, and um, in 2016, uh, the, the, the emissions of CO2 were 41 gigatons of, C, of CO2, 41 gigatons. And um, uh, there were a few years where there was no increase. And this was considered a, a big achievement because the, the GDP, the world GDP was, was growing, but the global emissions of CO2 were not. Uh, but in 2017, the emissions uh, again gr uh, grew by 2%, 2018 again by 2%, 2019 by 0.6%. And now in the year where we are now, uh, of course, relative to 2019, uh, we expect a decrease in 7%, a decrease in 7% due to the uh, pandemic, for, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, greenhouse gases scenarios uh, are, have been made by Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, over a period of 30 years and includes several generations of scenarios. Uh, um, just to, to remind, uh, 
to remind you that the IPCC was uh, instituted in 1988 um, and uh, by the um, World Meteorological Organization and by the United Nations Program uh, for the Environment, uh, UNEP and WMO. And in 1990, after two years, they produced the first report, the first report of the IPCC. And there have been uh, five reports, five reports have been published, and the, the sixth uh, report is uh, due to come uh, next year. <laughs> now, um, in, in these reports, uh, scenarios were made. And scenarios are very important because uh, climate change uh, is something uh, that is not southern and something that uh, will be um, uh, present for uh, many years to come. So it's uh, a um, medium and long term challenge. And therefore, uh, we need scenarios uh, to see what will be the consequences of um, uh, using more fossil fuels, for, for instance, or less fossil fuels. And uh, these, uh, uh, and they have been also, uh, they have been also very important to uh, evaluate the future impacts of climate change, the impacts in the future, uh, not only those that are actually occurring now, but those that uh, will happen in the future. So uh, these um, scenarios, the first one was made in uh, 1990. Uh, in the first scientific assessment. Uh, then there were scenarios uh, in 1992, uh, which are usually called the 1992 IPCC scenarios. And then there was a special report on emission scenarios, SRESH, in 2000, which was a very, um, it's a very well-known uh, report and very well-known scenarios. And then uh, there are, have been more uh, scenarios um, uh, in 2010, the representative concentration pathways, the RCPs, and in 2014, the shared socioeconomic pathways, SSPs, uh, which have been extensively, extensively used in recent IPCC reports, but they have not be, been done uh, by the IPCC, but uh, outside the IPCC, well, in collaboration with uh, the IPCC. So next slide, please. So um, uh, I will show a figure, a, a slide with a, with a figure with, a, and uh, in this figure you will have um, uh, you will have uh, four uh, scenarios that were made in 1990 by the EPCC in the first report, uh, which are called labeled A, B, C, D, and the first one is called the non-intervention scenario. Uh, notice that uh, people at that time didn't use the word mitigation. Uh, so non-intervention scenario, uh, since it do does not explicitly include mitigation measures. So it's like, uh, well, uh, there is climate change, but we are not going to, to do anything about in terms of energy and uh, other uh, sectors of the economy. So, uh, well, uh, emissions will grow uh, just uh, um, with other drivers, with the driver of uh, economic development, the, the need to increase economic prosperity, not, not with the preoccupation with climate change. And then there, there are three other scenarios called B, C, and D, which are intervention scenarios, that's the name that was used, that incorpor incorporate a progressive penetration of controls on greenhouse gas emissions, that's to say, mitigation. But it's interesting to see this language, you know, this sort of a nuanced uh, language, not very explicit. Um, and um, so now let's let, let's see the figure, the next figure. In the next, uh, you, you see um, uh, uh, the, the one in yellow, uh, you can't see it uh, well, but uh, uh, you see in yellow here, like a straight line. And then you see uh, the other three, which are most lower. And these scenarios go beyond, uh, they go beyond 2020, they go up to 2025. And what is the red curve? Oh, the red curve are the actual emissions, the historical emissions of CO2. 
So you see that the historical emissions of CO2 are above for quite a large uh, period of time are above the uh, scenario where there was no intervention, uh, where there was no mitigation measures, very far away from the scenarios that correspond to uh, mitigation measures. So in the next slide, uh, uh, following the, the first uh, scenario, um, the, uh, you see in, in, the, uh, in the IPCC report, uh, to start an IPCC report, um, uh, the United Nations um, Convention um, uh, has to, to draw some terms of reference to do the, to do the report. And in these terms of reference, um, uh, it was excluded the, that um, the um, uh, scenario makers, that the scientists and uh, engineers and, um, would consider explicitly, would consider explicitly mitigation measures. So in all the scenarios that um, followed uh, the first report, uh, there was uh, no comparison between what, uh, in very simple terms, we, we would say a scenario without mitigation and scenarios with mitigation. Okay. So uh, you, you may ask, well, wh wh what's the reason for that? Well, the reason is, is rather obscure. There is um, not uh, any documentation on that but it is likely related to the backstage pressure that the fossil fuel lobby exert, exerted on the IPCC proceedings, mainly through the United States. Um, next slide, please. So the next group of, of uh, scenarios were the ES92 series uh, in, published in 1992. And uh, you see here that um, the scenarios are much closer, much closer to uh, the historical emissions. Uh, this one in yellow uh, is a um, very well known, very well known scenario is the ES92A. And, um, and, and, and again, uh, you, you, you don't see in the report that that is uh, a scenario without uh, uh, mitigation measures, you say that that is a, a business as usual scenario. But uh, it's interesting that um, uh, it has been very successful. I mean, this, this ES92, you see uh, uh, historical emissions, they follow it very well. But the difference between uh, this uh, scenario and, and the other ones are, um, and, and uh, the first ones are that uh, here, uh, you, one talks about drivers like uh, uh, population growth, global population grow, growth, about um, uh, GDP growth, about uh, uh, primary energy supply uh, as the drivers. And uh, you, you, you don't have uh, a discussion on uh, having mitigation measures or not. Now, the next slide shows um, uh, the, the stress scenarios that were very um, used for, for a long time. Um, many people who worked on, on this, on climate change and, 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 in, and especially on the impact of climate change, uh, they know quite well about these scenarios. It's the A1, the A1, the A2, the B1, B2. And these scenarios, again, they didn't talk about mitigation, uh, but uh, there were scenarios that uh, resulted from a, um, a conceptual framework in, in a plan with two lines, one line where uh, there will be greater priority to the economy and uh, on the other extreme of that line, uh, greater priority for the environment and uh, at cross at perpendicular direction, direction was a, a more local governance to uh, and the other extreme more global. So um, very general concepts uh, about the, the future, uh, the future uh, 
uh, pathway of uh, of development uh, at, at the global scale. Of course, these these uh, these scenarios were very detailed because they not only gave a um, uh, the uh, uh, a projection for the global emissions, but also for the emissions of each continent, and and one can, could also do that for each country. Uh, but uh, on the basis of these very general concepts, uh, more concern with the economy or more concern with the environment, more concern uh, at the local level, or more concern at issues at the global uh, at the global scale. Next slide, please. Now, these uh, were developed uh, later, 2015. Uh, they are the shared socioeconomic pathways. Uh, and, um, and here, uh, there is, uh, in a way, uh, um, reference to mitigation. And uh, you see here, for instance, uh, SSP1 is a sustainable world, high international cooperation, high technological improvement, high environmental awareness. And on the other extreme, we have the SSP3, which is a fragmented world. In other words, in other words, uh, a world with protectionism, uh, a world with trade wars, uh, a world with low international cooperation, uh, with low technological improvement and technological cooperation, and uh, and you have then other scenarios uh, in this uh, framework that you see on on the left. I don't have time to go over the details, but um, uh, so the next slide. Uh, in the next slide, you see uh, the comparison of these uh, um, these projections, these scenario, the projections obtained with these scenarios um, for the, the CO2 emissions and the, the uh, historical emissions. And see there is quite a good agreement. So we are very far, very far from those scenarios of 19, 90, you know, the ones that explicitly said that it was intervention scenario and it was the emissions were much lower. Now they are all closer and uh, well, there is some difference here. Another point that I wish to, to make is that um, uh, uh, there is uh, nothing compared, with, I mean, here, there is nothing that uh, leads to uh, uh to, to, to that that very strong decrease in emissions that is necessary for the two degrees for the two uh, for the for the objective of the Paris agreement of two degrees uh, Celsius next slide now here uh, you have the RCPs uh, these uh, are based on uh, the radiative forcing they are in fact uh, radiative forcing scenarios the evolution of radiative forcing the radiative forcing caused by anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases. And you see the RCP uh, 2.6. Uh, this is different from emissions, you see. This is uh, radiative forcing. And this one here, in fact, uh, complies, is in accordance with the Paris Agreement, the 2.6. And then you have the 8.5, which is the other extreme, and which uh, has been considered as uh, a scenario which uh, is uh, extremely unlikely. It's a scenario that is uh, uh, very, very improbable. Um, and then you have the 4.5, uh, which uh, leads to three degrees uh, increase uh, that you, you see that in the next slide. And uh, you see uh, in one of the representations of these RCPs, uh, the temperature, and you see uh, the two degrees of the RCP 2.6, uh, as a function of time, of course, uh, this is the end of the century, and then the, the 4.5 in green that leads to about three degrees, but three degrees only uh, in after to the, the, the end of the century, and then you have the 8.5 where the temperature continue, continues to increase quite uh, significantly after uh, the end of the century. Go to the next slide. Uh, now, this is a paper that has been uh, recently published um, in this uh, Nature uh, Communications Earth and Environment, uh, well, a few days ago. And uh, it's the variability in historical emission trends suggests a need for a wide range of global scenarios and regional analysis. And I will very briefly mention some points about this, this uh, work. Uh, 
uh, which the authors are, are, are down here. Uh, and three of the, there are um, one, two, three, four, five, six authors. Uh, three are connected with uh, uh, the CCM CE 3 c Research Center, and the other three uh, are, um, are, uh, um, are Dutch uh, researchers. Now, in the next slide, uh, you see again the historical emissions. The historical emissions now analyzed uh, in terms of um, uh, how strong was the increase? I mean, uh, the emissions uh, uh, are have a tendency to increase. That's very clear. I mean, as we look at, uh, at this graph, but you can, and this is a period that goes from uh, 1960 to 2017. And you can identify here uh, 11 sub periods, 11 sub periods, six periods uh, where uh, you have uh, um, an annual growth in, in CO2 emissions greater than 1% and then in red and then in blue shorter periods uh, where the, the growth is below, the average growth in that soup period is uh, below two, uh, below 1%. One, uh, 1%. And uh, we have uh, studied the correlation. What, what are the drivers? What are the drivers of these uh, changes? The drivers of these changes. And uh, uh, it turns out that the, the best uh, uh, match for a driver is, um, uh, is in fact the, um, the, the primary energy supply. Primary energy supply. That's described here, but it's difficult to see it in these circumstances. I mean, to, to communicate, you can see the paper, uh, it's uh, available. Um, and um, so the, the, the most uh, uh, significant driver, well, the driver that uh, uh, is more uh, uh, close to what is observed is the primary energy supply, the availability of energy, the availability of cheap energies, if you want, uh, cheap within commerce, uh, more than the, the global GDP. In other words, it, it points out to the, the, um, the conclusion, which is rather obvious, in fact, that energy is fundamental in our civilization. I mean, in our, um, in our model of development, energy is crucial. So if we have uh, um, a uh, abundant uh, primary energy supply, then we have a tendency to have a, a high GDP global um, uh, increase, annual increase. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, because about 80% of the prime energy, energy supply are fossil fuels, that means also an increase in the emissions. Now in the next slide, uh, well, this is essentially what I've just said, um, uh, the primary energy supply and the, 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 where you can, where the, what were the, the sources, the, the references that you, we use to, to obtain uh, all the, the, this data. On the next slide, please. Uh, well, here it, it's also a, a graph that is perhaps difficult in these circumstances to, to communicate. Uh, and this is in the paper that um, has been uh, recently published. But um, uh, this now goes, um, um, it's uh, a period from 1980 to 2019. And I will draw your attention to this um, broken line here, which is the average, the average <coughs> annual growth in this period of uh, CO2 anthropogenic emissions, which is um, um, above 1% annual, 1% per year. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, close to 2%, not very far from 2%. And then you have here all the families, the families of um, uh, projections. You have first uh, the one of the, um, of S, um, uh, the, the, the one of the first report of the IPCC in 1990, 
then you have the ES92, and then you have the SRES, the SRES, the very well known SRES, and then you have the RCPs that I've just mentioned, and then you have the SSPs, and then you have some more, uh, the, some more uh, uh, models that have been developed uh, recently, but I don't have time to, to explain in detail that. But, uh, and then you have these bars in black, you see, which are the average, the average of all these uh, different scenarios uh, in the first uh, IPCC report, in the S, uh, the, uh, the ES, uh, the ES92, you see here, and then uh, another, um, you have here another uh, bar here, uh, and these are quite good agreement, quite good agreement. And then curiously, you have here two of the SSP, which are quite below. So, uh, uh, and that means that these more recent scenarios, people were uh, trying to introduce in these scenarios, the mitigation measures, trying to see, well, how can we uh, really uh, decrease the emissions? Next slide, please. Uh, and here is uh, again uh, the same uh, the, the same comparison grouped in a cu cumulative way, and um, uh, and these are the the periods where you have uh, sub periods where you have a decrease in the growth of the emissions, and are related with different uh, uh, world events like, for instance, the 2008 2019 uh, global financial crisis. Uh, which was actually a short period. Um, so the next slide. Um, well, here it's uh, it's one of the main points of this uh, paper, uh, and that is that we have analyzed the OECD countries, or in other words, the countries which have a um, a. Uh, uh, modern economy, uh, well-developed modern economy, and uh, the non-OECD countries, which are the emergent uh, economies, in particular China. Um, and uh, and uh, you see that the growth in uh, emissions uh, here is much lower, and in fact, decreasing here, and uh, is growing very fast here. And uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, to, to uh, this growth is compatible, this growth for the non-OECD countries in this period that you have here from the year 2000 up to now, uh, this growth is compatible with the RCP 8.5, which is uh, one uh, quite, uh, uh, it's uh, food for thought. I mean, it's something that uh, is worthwhile uh, thinking about. It's in fact compatible with that scenario that uh, is, uh, uh, is um, unlikely at the global scale, but at the scale of the non-OECD countries is in fact uh, compatible with the RCP 8.5. Another thing that I would like to point out is that uh, we have distinguished between the territorial emissions and the consumption emissions. What are the territorial emissions which are represented in black? Well, the territorial emissions are the emissions of a given territory. For instance, in Portugal, what are all the sources of, of CO2 in Portugal? What are the consumption emissions? Well, the consumption emissions include the territorial emissions and the emissions that were needed to produce the goods that we consume in Portugal. See what I mean? We import uh, many goods from other countries and these goods uh, in those countries where they were produced, they gave rise to emissions. And if we count those emissions, then uh, we have the curves in red. So here, the consumption emissions are above the territorial emissions, but here, the consumption emissions are below the territorial emissions. See what I mean? Yeah. Okay, 
So in the next slide, now in the, in, uh, um, well, there are several possible ways in which a future can unfold. Governments in various countries could actively continue using fossil fuels, regardless of the Paris Agreement international ambition, uh, ambitions. <coughs> uh, some political leaders in key countries like the United States and Brazil support CO2 intensive economic growth, while fossil fuels are still heavily subsidized in EU member states. So it's important to mention this, uh, in spite of uh, EU having a quite um, uh, ambitious uh, um, climate and energy policy. And um, uh, well, digitalization could lead to increased efficiency, but could also increase energy use, uh, energy poverty, and many, many other uh, things that uh, uh, you can find in that, uh, in, in that paper about this uh, analysis. So in the next slide, um, uh, I will now mention br just briefly uh, what uh, are the impacts of um, of the COVID-19 pandemic on on this um, on this subject of uh, climate change, and uh, as 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 I already mentioned, uh, we expect a reduction in the CO2 emissions uh, of about um, uh, seven percent in 2020 relative to, to 2019. And this is going to be the largest reduction um, that was associated with other crises in the past, like the two uh, uh, world wars, uh, like the first and second world war, they implied reductions also in emissions, but not so strong as uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, the energy crisis in 1881, uh, the Spanish flu, the other pandemic, a uh, large pandemic, you see how the world has changed. I mean, the Spanish uh, flu uh, had uh, associated a much higher mortality than this uh, COVID-19, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, its uh, effect on, uh, on, 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 on the environment was much smaller than it is this, this now. So this uh, shows how much energy per, per capita the world now consumes compared with those times uh, in the beginning of the, of the 20th century. And also the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Next slide. Now you see what uh, matters as regards climate change is the concentration, not so much the emissions. Uh, of course the emissions are important, but you have to decrease the emissions for a long time until the concentrations start to decrease. And this reduction of about 7% in one year will only reduce the emissions by a very small amount. It's going from the red to the blue, you see? Uh, these are the concentrate, the, these are, sorry, these are the red to the blue in emissions, and this is uh, what happens in the concentration. So we would need uh, just to give you an idea of um, the, the challenge that we face, we would need to have uh, for the next 10 years, a reduction of the order of 6.5%. This year is, will be about 7%, but we will, would need in all the, the, the next 10 years, we would need a reduction of about 6.5% every year global to reach the Paris Agreement. Every year, during 10 years, a reduction comparable with the reduction that we had this year because of the COVID pandemic. Next slide. And now, so the question now is, how is the fossil fuel going to respond? Because um, there is much less consumption of, um, of fossil fuels, in particular coal. That's good news. Uh, coal is not so competitive as it was uh, as regards uh, natural gas and as regards renewable energy. So uh, coal is being phased out. Portugal is a good example. Um, we, we have two uh, uh, coal power stations, uh, one in uh, Sines and the other in Pego, and the one in Sines is going to close unexpectedly the, 
the operator ADP announced that. I mean, the government was surprised by, with this announcement that next year uh, they will finish the coal that they still have uh, in, in the facility and, and they will not going to buy more coal for, for the, to, 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 to run the, the, the power station. Uh, and this is happening uh, not exactly in these uh, terms, but uh, all over the world. So coal uh, is, uh, uh, there is much uh, less consumption of coal. Oil is much more uh, difficult to predict and natural gas will uh, be more resilient. Now, as regards oil, you see here something uh, which uh, is uh, interesting. And this is um, monthly crude oil production. And these are the big, the big oil productors in the world, United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. But you see, Russia and Saudi Arabia had a much higher production than the United States, much higher, much higher. But the United States picked up, picked up the pace, uh, reached here, and then here, this last increase, this last increase is the, frac the fracking technology that was invented in the United States, the tight oil, uh, especially in the Midwest, um, uh, which uh, has been able to uh, put the United States as the largest oil producer in the world. But next slide, please. But what has happened? Well, it has happened that with the pandemic, there is much less consumption of oil because people have less mobility, um, in, in, especially in air travel, but also land travel, not so much uh, by sea. And the, the price of petrol became negative. And in the next slide, you see that it has recuperated from the negative, but it's still at about 40, $40 per barrel, which is not, which is not sustainable for fracking. So this is a big challenge for the uh, oil fracking producers at the moment. Next slide. <coughs> so in fact, we have uh, sort of three scenarios for, for oil, a uh, uh, full recovery scenario, scenario, oil demand is restored, previous levels and continues to increase up to the mid thirties from beginning to declined slowly by the end of the decade. Going it alone is a scenario characterized by strong deglobalization de process, which is a likely scenario. And uh, uh, if we remember uh, the trade war between United States and China, if we remember the protectionist measures that United States have, uh, have um, uh, introduced and the, uh, the other protection measures in, in, in response that some countries have produced, including the European Union. So global oil consumption is likely to reach peak consumption before 2030, less consumption. And then you have the greener growth scenario, which is the only that includes a possibility of effective implementation of the energy transition in the EU and the USA. And in this scenario, demand is predicted to stabilize in, in the 2020s and fall significantly in the 2030s. And this gives some chance, some chance, a very small chance, but I would say some chance of complying with the Paris Agreement. Next slide. Thank you for your attention and thank you for uh, the team that uh, made the, this work, which are uh, mentioned here, Jasper Pedersen, Detlef Vim. Wooden, Bruno Parisio, Rob Swart, and Joyeta Gupta. Thank you for your attention. I had my mic off. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Philippe Duarte Sanch, for your uh, presentation and for all this food for thought for us to, to think about uh, this issue. Um, so now I invite, before going to the comments that we already have here on YouTube, I invite everyone watching to um, please leave your questions and comments on the chat on uh, YouTube that you have on your right. And so now I'm going to, in, in the few minutes that we have, I'm going to check the comments that we have here and uh, invite Professor Flip Duartsen just to, to comment or to answer. Um, so we have here uh, a first question by Artur Gil that was already answered by 
uh, GSPER, but I would invite Professor Philippe Duarte Santos perhaps to add a few more uh, remarks. So Artur Gil uh, mentions, uh, do you think that Arctic melting is also increasing seriously global methane, methane emissions? And uh, GISPER here in the chat, which I, I think GISPER is one of the co-authors of the, of the paper that you mentioned. Uh, he mentions that, yes, it may reduce the budget of emissions we can emit if we want to reach the, the Paris targets. And uh, mentions a new study that found pockets of methane getting released in the Arctic. I don't know if uh, you would like to, to add something to this. Well, uh, just to say that uh, th this is definitely a possibility and um, there hasn't been much research uh, in situ. I mean, research in the Arctic to, to evaluate what are the emissions. There has been some research, but it's mostly in Siberia that this happens in Alaska, North Canada, of course, uh, and um, so I think the, the assessment of the, of the risk is still, uh, I mean, from the science point of view is still, uh, I mean, needs uh, much more, uh, much more research, much more work. Okay, thank you. Um, and there's also uh, comments thanking for your presentation. And uh, also, Ricard Coel is also following here um, in the presentation and mentions being a co-author of one of the papers. Uh, while we wait for uh, a few more questions that you might have, and uh, also I invite Professor Rui Perdigão, who is also here in the Zoom session to ask a question if you would like to. Um, I, I would ask concerning uh, this paper that you have just published about the, um, the emissions and the RCP 8.5. Um, so um, in terms of communication, uh, what would you suggest that we should do? Because RCP 8.5, is usually presented as um, as business, business as usual uh, scenario. And so uh, should we change something in the way it is communicated? Uh, what do you recommend based on your results? No, the, the, the RCP 8.5 is, is not really a business as usual. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a scenario, um, you know, um, uh, stop. Um, it's... Um, uh, it's a scenario that, ha that has been criticized uh, by being uh, um, by corresponding to very uh, uh, high uh, increase uh, in uh, the radiative forcing, and so uh, a scenario that could only be realized by very high emissions of, of greenhouse gases, and a scenario that corresponds to the very high increase in temperature. But uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a business as usual. I mean, business as usual is something that is difficult to define precisely. But the fact is that some people have said uh, we shouldn't talk about 8.5 because it's something uh, out of the question. But the fact is that uh, in, in fact, I mean, uh, the non-OCDE countries, they follow quite uh, well <coughs> the 8.5. A scenario. Uh, as regards uh, Ricardo Encarnacion, yes, he, he was a, a co-author of, of a paper who, who has been accepted for, public, for, for publication, but it's still not published. And I mentioned here only the papers that have been published, but thank you for, for his, uh, uh, co uh, for his uh, participation in, in that paper that it will, will soon be published. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and now I come back to the comments. We have another question slash comment here on YouTube by Jiling Yu. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, so um, she first thank, starts by thanking you for your wonderful presentation. And she mentions she's curious to know how carbon trade schemes are included in the scenarios and how they might influence emission outcomes. Are, uh, as they are schemes being rapidly developed and being used in both US, Europe, and China. Um, this is, uh, if I understood correctly, it's carbon trade, isn't it? Carbon trade, emissions trade, yeah. Well, um, this uh, has been uh, essentially promoted by, by the European Union, but um, 
Uh, it is an, in, an, an in contribution, but uh, I, I must say that it has not been uh, uh, very su successful. Uh, well, I mean, I have to, 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 to be precise here. I mean, the European Union uh, has reduced its, its emissions, has reduced its emissions by, by a significant amount um, since uh, 1990. Uh, the United States have also reduced significantly their emissions. Uh, that's important also to say in recent years. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, I don't think that uh, has to do really with um, uh, with uh, with uh, trading uh, emissions uh, of the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, the Kyoto Protocol was success successful. I mean, it reached the, the, the goal that it had established, um, but uh, in fact, uh, uh, um, it is, of course, we can think, it's thinkable to imagine the world having one system of, uh, of emission trading, uh, including China and the United States and Europe and many other countries like Brazil and uh, South, uh, South 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 Africa and other countries, but um, the political conditions to uh, the geopolit the geostrategic uh, uh, chess work, you know, uh, the political conditions to do that are are um, very challenging. Thank you. Um, I'm now checking. For now, we don't have uh, more questions. I could and probably say are... something very quick. Uh, okay, yes, please. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, I, I, I'm very uh, grateful for the excellent presentation. Uh, it is a very great opportunity for outreach and to share all these recent results and also the, the history that led to them um, and also to clarify and, and foster the scientific literacy uh, about these topics. Uh, and uh, regarding the methane issue, uh, I would just like to add to what was already uh, said um, into making a distinction between uh, the Arctic cover over the ocean and the um, boreal latitudes, so the, uh, the glacial areas that are covering uh, land. So you will not find methane easily in the ocean, no, uh, it will be over land. So it will be the ice uh, covering the permafrost, so this area that was permanently covered in ice over land and that essentially uh, is, uh, is locking as a time machine uh, the conditions of the atmosphere and, uh, and the interface between soil and atmosphere uh, over land coming from biotic organic processes um, over these areas. And hence, uh, as, the, as there is thawing or melting of the permafrost over vast lands within the Arctic Circle, uh, then uh, you have reports of uh, increased emissions of methane and other and other, other gases. Naturally, as Professor Philip said, a lot of research is still required because the, the ecosystems of such areas are not uniform and were not uniform at the time. And hence there will be pockets of high emissions, whereas there will be a vast areas without such. Over the oceans, you will uh, mostly have um, other chemicals being released. And uh, and this is to say that methane is indeed a wild card in all these dynamics. And hence, it is very important to keep in mind that the climate models uh, need to and are being currently updated. So we are developing a new suite of climate system dynamic models uh, that will come and bring out these uncertainty metrics into a more physically consistent manner, thereby contributing to these vast ongoing efforts. And I. I shut up now by uh, making a call to everybody into contributing, into entering this business because uh, climate modeling is not a closed business. There is plenty and plenty of work ahead and it still needs to be done and to be continued, to continue protecting our planet in this great cause. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Professor Flip Duartsench would like to add a final comment before we wrap up the session. Uh, you mentioned me? No. Yes, yes. 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 Well, uh, thank you very much for, 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 uh, 
for for um, attending this this um, this uh, inter this uh, conference, this video conference, and um, but, but that's all. Uh, I mean, uh, I have to say, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, all for, for thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Professor Philip Duartsen for for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you, Professor Rui Perdigão, also for being here and participating and presenting Professor Philip and posing uh, asking your questions. Thank you, Mariana, who is here on the backstage helping the connection with the YouTube. And thank you all of you who followed uh, this session. Thank you for your participation. And we hope to meet you again here online for the next